right. All right. Um, my question was about um, separating yourself. Um, you were talking about separating yourself from unbelievers, but what about the believers who the devil uses to distract you or to deter you from what God has instructed you to do? How do you um, sever those ties? Or is it necessary for you to sever those ties? How do you deal with that? <coughs> Well, I think one way to deal with it is to rebuke them, just like the Lord did. Uh, when, of course, Peter believed the Lord, you know, because, of course, he did because he walked with him. He followed him. When the Lord said to, to follow me, he followed him. A lot of people didn't do that. But whenever he tried to get God, whenever he tried to get the Lord to go against God's will for him, he rebuked him. And sometimes that's what you have to do. He called him out. He said, Satan, get behind me, for you don't savor the things of God, but the things of man. You see? And so, uh, I tell you what, after a few, a few rebukes, uh, people will separate themselves if it's meant to be, you see? Whether they believe it or not. Sometimes, I will say this, sometimes people will not understand. I don't know, let me rephrase that. Most of the time, people will not understand what God is telling you to do because he's not telling them to do what he's telling you to do. The only person that have walked in your shoes are you. And so oftentimes when people are trying to offer advice and they may be doing it lovingly and from, you know, from a loving standpoint as far as they can see, it's because they are doing it out of their flesh and what they can naturally see, you see. And so <clears throat> we have to. Uh, learn to rebuke people and, and let them know straight out, I'm going to do what God is telling me to do, regardless of what you have to say about it, you know, and then respectfully ask them not to come against that, you see, because what can happen <laughs> in the 13th chapter of 1st King, the, the, the old prophet and the, and the young prophet, God used that young prophet uh, to, to, to go against the, the, the altar of Baal. And God told that young prophet, don't, don't go the same way you came. You go out, don't go and eat with anybody either. And so after he did that, just to make a long story short, uh, he had an old prophet come to him and, and say, hey, won't you come back and eat with me? You know, now that's just naturally what, you know, ministers want to do, fellowship. But the young prophet told him, well, God have already told me not to go back the way I came and not to go and eat with anybody in their homes. And he said... But an angel told me that that is okay. And so the young prophet did what the old prophet told him to do. Why? Because he respected him because of his age. He felt like he's an older man. He has more experience in the Lord. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. You see? And so what happens is people, we disregard what Paul says in the first chapter of Galatians. Though we are an angel, come and preach any other thing than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Sometimes that means mom and daddy got to be accursed when they say something contrary to what God says, you see, and not just in his word, but in our lives. I, I, I can tell you from experience, people don't believe what God is telling you to do until you believe it and until you step out on it. Amen. Think about it. If Jesus, he started off with 12 men. He at that time, he was the only one that believed who he said he was. And because he believed it, now it's millions of people that believe it. But if he had been, if the devil was able to get him and, and to cause doubt, well, maybe I'm not the son of God. I got all these feelings on the inside of me. I don't feel like the son of God. You see, <laughs> then where would we be? You see, and so we do our best helping people when we stand on what God tell us to do. You see, and then later on, they'll believe it. Just like the Bible says, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe he was the son of God. But, you know, the time came where they did, but it took him standing on that word. And so sometimes if they're believers, uh, we don't we don't want to hang around unbelief. I put it that way. We don't want to uh, just put ourselves in the middle of that. And if we know and I'm going to tell you what I do, you know, if I know that somebody don't don't believe, you know, concerning something, then I have to. I have to distance myself, not necessarily cut them off, whether they say they're believers or not. I have to distance myself from that situation. 
And I'm going to tell you why. Because their unbelief can stop you uh, and, and can hinder the work that God want to do in you. Jesus Christ, when he, one day he walked into a, a funeral. It was a young girl there, dead. And the Bible says that they had mourners. Now, of course, back then they had professional mourners. Basically, paid folks that came to your funeral, funeral to cry over you so that folks would think you were so important. So, they're in that morning, and, and the Lord asked, well, why are y'all crying? She's not dead, she's just asleep. And the Bible says that they laughed him to scorn. Now, I want you to picture this. They went from crying to laughing at the Lord. Now, you would think that people would want better. In other words, well, I, we hope that she is just asleep. No, they, they were laughing at what he had to say. The Bible says that he put them out of the house. Because as long as doubt was there, he wasn't going to be able to do what he needed to do. And I can tell you that from experience. That when folks are doubting, you won't be able to do what God has called you to do. That same brother junior that I, I, I've told you about, the Lord had sent him uh, back in the 60s to pray for, for this white fella at 3 o'clock in the morning. In, in, a, in a very racist town. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, he knocks on the door. Didn't know the man uh, or anything like that. As he started driving, the Lord told him, make a left, make a right. This is how you know. And so he finally got there. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, the, 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 the uh, ma young man's mother answered the phone, uh, answered the door. Of course, you know, now this is, again, isn't something that, you know, in Louisiana, you're encouraged to do, knocking on folks' door at 3 in the morning, especially back in the 60s, you see. And so uh, he knocks on that door, and uh, he says, Ma'am, you don't know me. He said, but the Lord sent me here to pray for a young man. He said, that young man has cancer, and he, he, he's a pale fella, and he has polka dots in his, he has uh, 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 blemishes in his face, and he has on pajamas that are polka dotted, red polka dots. And a lady began to cry and grabbed him up and started hugging him and saying, that's my son. So he went back there to the room, and when he get back there, it's full of people that, because they've already sent him home to die, and they're expecting him to die in a minute. And so when he gets back there, uh, he, he gets on his knees to begin to pray for the man. And when he, when he gets on his knees, the Lord speaks to him and say, somebody here is not believing. And so he said, I didn't raise up. I just kept facing the young man, and I said, the Lord spoke and said, there's somebody here that's not believing. He said, if, if somebody here have doubt, if it's you, could you please step out of this room? You see, he had to be very careful, because again, this is the 60s, uh, he, he's black, these people are white, mm -hmm. and nobody knows where he is, you see. So it's not like he has backup, mm -hmm. you see. So, <laughs> so he said he didn't turn around and look, he just heard the door open and close. And he said that uh, he prayed for the young man, and uh, before the day was over with, the young man was up eating breakfast, and they were all praising the Lord. But after he got finished praying for the young man, he turned around, he, 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 he left out, and as he was walked outside of the house, who was standing outside but the young man's pastor? Mm -hmm. And the pastor asked him, I need to ask you to forgive me. He said, because I was that one in there that was doubting. He said, when you came in there, in that room, I knew that the Lord was going to use you to heal him. I knew the Lord was going to heal him. And he said, so the devil got me to thinking, you mean, Lord, all of these years that I've been praying for him, and you're going to use a black man to heal him? And that's all it took was that one thought to keep that young man from receiving his healing, you see. And so <clears throat> Brother Junior had to be in tune with the Spirit to recognize that even that's a, a, a doubt. You see, even that's doubt. And so that's, that, that's what we're saying is that we, we, we can't allow ourselves to be in a company of doubt. Because whether we know it or not, it will affect us. It will affect what God want to do through us. And we, what happens is we put ourselves through extra battles that we don't ha normally have to go through. When we, when we decide to, to walk around in doubt, uh, you know, and walk around uh, and be among people who are doubting what God has for us. Jesus Christ said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and among his own kin. That's the reason why 
In the sixth chapter of Mark, when Jesus went to his hometown, the Bible says that he, he could do no mighty miracles there except heal a few sick people. Why? Because he was in his hometown and people doubted who he was. You see, they didn't they didn't believe who he was. And so he had to separate himself from that. And so sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in that position to, to you know, to have to battle with that. Because believe me when I tell you, that's a spirit that you that you have to deal with. Unbelief is a spirit. You see. Amen.